Star Trek, the final franchise. Star Trek is easily one of my favorite science fiction franchises of all time. I mean, it's got pretty much everything that you would want from science fiction. It's got a lot of sex. It's got Klingons. I mean, look at look at the, look at his eyes. Look at his eyes. Glory to you and your house. It's got that. It's got in-depth storylines. It's got thoughtful science fiction. It's got weird, weird stuff as well, like sex salamanders. We will be talking about the sex salamanders in just a minute. I don't know how I'm going to enter this into the log. I look forward to reading it. And Star Trek is all wrapped up in this ethos of this belief that humanity will be better, that we will go on to our bright future as human beings and cultivate the best parts of ourselves, the parts of ourselves that are meaningful and positive and kind and care about infinite diversity and infinite combinations, as well as sex salamanders. It was incredible. But somehow it doesn't mean as much as I thought it would. Huh? And so it's why I get so passionate about Star Trek on this channel, but because Star Trek is a 55 year old franchise at this point, it can be quite a bit intimidating to get into. I mean, there are 13 movies, three animated shows, a ton of books, a ton of comics, I think nine TV shows either made or in the works right now, uh, not counting the animated shows. So there's just, a, there's just a lot, there's a lot. And it can be very intimidating for newcomers to try and step in to this giant world that is Star Trek. Especially considering the fact that the franchise contradicts itself all the time, except for with the sex salamanders. Always gets that right. That is 100% canon and we care about it deeply as Star Trek fans. I guess I went into this looking for a quick fix. But because I am a kind, loving, caring person, and I do all this for all of you, I decided for today's video, I want to provide a kind of Star Trek public service for new fans of the franchise, where I'm just going to try to explain the entire Star Trek universe, all the big moments, all the races and aliens, and everything that you need to know just to have the basics to get into Star Trek, no matter where you want to begin, whether it's Star Trek the Animated Series, whether it's with the Sex Salamanders, Next Generation, the original series, Kirk, Picard, whatever, I will get into all of the basics of the world building of Star Trek in this video, and I'm gonna explain it in as calmly, rationally, and as easily digestible as possible. And I think, I think that's going to be pretty doable. Very, very doable. How do you know this isn't the best thing that's ever happened to me? That's a possibility. And then again, it could kill you. And for those of you who need a little bit of a tease to get into this video, besides the fact that you can clearly see my nipples in this uniform, I'm going to be changing out of this. We all know it. I know it. This is the nipple uniform. I know how to start my videos off with a tease. It's fine. We'll get it. But here's another tease. As you notice, this is the board of all of the aliens, the major aliens in Star Trek. And you can clearly see a big blank spot here. That is because I'm going to explain to all of you who definitively the most important aliens in all of Star Trek are, and it is none of these on the board right now. Stick around for that. I'm gonna go change out of the nipple uniform and we'll begin to explain this universe of Star Trek as calmly as possible. Let's go. I'm Captain Scott Bakula of the Starship Enterprise. Well, I'm Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS. I'd love to enter your prize. Well, in that case, Captain, I better polarize my hull plating. Mm, permission to come aboard? Permission granted. Oh, let's go this far and much further. Oh, it's definitely going to be a long road. Oh, engage, engage. Uh, hello. Uh, this isn't what you think. Okay, it's exactly what you think. Anyways, before we get to my uh, breakdown and take that however you wish, I just wanted to give you all a quick update on what I'm working on with my channel over the next few months. So this video that you're currently watching right now uh, quite obviously aims to be a fun, hilarious, 
time where you laugh at me, not with me, as I take you through the franchise that continually inspires me to see hope in the future. I've been dealing with a lot of harder topics on this channel, as many of you know, um, and it's sadly not the fun kind of hard. And the reason I've been doing that is because the world is scary right now for a lot of people, but especially for trans and LGBTQ folks, and personally I felt a need to have to push back against that. But as we've fallen further and further into these culture war and toxic discourses, I've started to really learn that there's real importance in showing my joy and showing what inspires me and makes me laugh. And in many ways, I think it's just as, if not more important than breaking down the terrible, disgusting things. Because by constantly being on their terms allows them to control the conversation. But if we have things on our terms, we can actually be constructive, show how we're human and focus on that brighter future for tomorrow. I want to start focusing on building conversations about LGBTQ and social issues and joyous fun things and hopeful things on our own terms. So with that being said, I just wanna let you know some of the videos I have coming up. Next month, I have a video about masculinity, radicalization, and identity that again, will be a more difficult topic and I aim it to be a complicated, messy, but hopefully constructive video. And it's gonna be a video that I'll be very honest, I'm filming tonight and I'm honestly been kind of having a little bit of anxiety about because it's going to be talking about not only all of that but some personal stuff that I haven't really discussed open, openly. Um, so uh, give me some support uh, with that if, if you can. Uh, just I'm not asking for views or anything, just kind words. Um, but anyways, beyond that, uh, focusing on more joyful things, I'm also working on a huge video right now, like a huge one, that I'm doing with Aranoc, as many of you know on this channel, and the Museum of Pop Culture here in Seattle. So it's gonna have big production values, and it's gonna be all about Star Wars. But whoops, it's actually not about Star Wars. It's about fascism, or hope in the face of fascism. You know what I mean. And I'm also going to have much more content about LGBTQ issues, like I want to do a video about sex in transgender people's lives. And then I also have nerdy stuff too, like my sex in Star Trek Deep Space Nine video, which is coming, I promise you. And they're all going to be bigger than I've ever done before, like I'm planning on renting out a bar for the Deep Space Nine video, so it's going to be a huge thing. But as a result, all these videos are actually going to take longer than I've been doing on these videos for a while. So apologies in advance, these videos are going to be a little bit more sporadic. But the biggest thing that I'm going to be working on over the next few months, if you missed the announcement uh, last month, is I'm directing a freaking short film. Yeah, I'm directing a movie called Identities, which is a cyberpunk story about identity in a digital future that is quite literally not coded for human beings, but COGS. I am so excited and passionate about this project, and I'm working on it, as I said in the announcement, with my amazing producer and Star Trek's own, Dr. Aaron McDonald, who is amazing. Quite literally, this past month, I've been drowning in meetings and emails that she's been setting up, hiring cast and crew, and I can't say who we're working with just yet, but I, it's been kind of exciting and awesome, and I really think that Identities is going to be uh, something very special. At the very least, it's going to be special to me because it already is, and I hope that when it finally releases at the end of this year, or close to, it'll be special for all of you. And I do wish to say a thank you to the fact that Identities is actually being funded directly and distributed by Nebula, my streaming service that I'm building with my friends and fellow creators. It's been so amazing to see Nebula fund amazing content like Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tubes the Prince, which is a freaking trans and queer Shakespeare multiverse sci-fi film. Yeah, those are all words in a sentence together. Or also Unrated, which is the amazing Maggie Mae Fish's series about algorithm unfriendly movie history. Or you also have things like Nebula Classes, which feature creators like my friend and adorable human being, For a Man in a Foreign Land, where he teaches how to tell great stories. And on top of all of that stuff with Nebula, is I've personally been releasing some video exclusives to Nebula and on my Patreon as well, like my recent deep dive into Star Trek Enterprise Season 1 that's currently up there right now. So if you want me to talk more about Scotty Bats than I'm already gonna do in this video, that's there for you. Yet, what's most important to me about Nebula is that while Nebula is supporting me and all of my fellow creators, Nebula is supported directly by all of you. And I should say for myself, obviously between the enormous amount of work and meetings and stuff that I'm doing to make identities right now, and also hoping to increase the scope of my YouTube content, I'm really swamped, which means that, like I said, videos will take a bit longer. And that is a little bit scary, given that, you know, this is my full-time job and the algorithm punishes you taking along between videos. So I just have to reiterate, having your support via Nebula and Patreon as well is what makes all of this possible. And also funds my Scotty Bats addiction too. 
So here comes to the promotion stuff because the best way to get identities when it comes out is to sign up for Nebula right now with the annual plan. Because not only does that support me right now paying my bills as I make all of this stuff, but it gets you access to the prints and Nebula classes immediately and identities when it comes out within the next year. And if you sign up using the link below, you get 40% off annual plans, which is as little as over $2.50 a month. I do mean this very deeply and sincerely. I do think that this is a great deal that supports other creators and me doing incredible things with Nebula in a way that we couldn't do otherwise and gets you access to it all. I have so much cool stuff coming, be it personal, vulnerable, exciting, sexy, and hopeful, but it will take time to make it special, and I want it all to be special. So thank you all for joining me in this journey, for supporting me in this journey, and for my Nebula subscribers and patrons as well, Thank you for quite literally paying my bills. I owe all of this to all of you, uh, including all of these things. Uh, and I hope that I give back some of it to you. Except for my Scotty Bats, you can't have him. But with that said, now you get to watch me have a breakdown about Star Trek, which is somehow different than the rest of my videos on this channel. Now where did Picard go? Oh, there he is. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, just watch the video. I don't, don't support me. Don't support whatever this is. So, before we get to the aliens of Star Trek, believe me, we'll be returning to this board. But, to begin, I think the best place to start with explaining the story of Star Trek is to begin with a timeline. Oh yeah, I invested in a flipping board. The board flips. Do you have whiteboard envy? Because I know I do. Really, Captain, my modesty does not bear close examination, Mr. Spark. So you'd think with the timeline of Star Trek, it would make the most sense to begin, you know, at the beginning. You have the 1960s here up until the 2100. So this is like the, this is the 22nd century right here. We got the 23rd century right here. We got 24th. And then we got like the 20, 2500, like 2400, the 25th century. Let's we'll just do 25th century and beyond there. So this is kind of generally the timeline that we're gonna be working with the, of, of events. But the best place to begin for Star Trek is in the 23rd century, about 200 years or so from where we are with the original Star Trek show, the one with Captain Kirk, Spock, you know, McCoy, the one that everyone knows. You know, there's the crew on this USS Enterprise, there's a ship in the Federation, and in Starfleet, the Federation being this government of planets of people coming together because we all believe in the betterment of humanity. A bunch of different aliens coming and being like, ah, we're gonna make culture together. It's all gonna be a lot of culture-y stuff. Because you'll have to answer to the Federation. We'll be back every year to collect our cut. Going out and exploring the galaxy for Starfleet, this sort of kind of military, not a military, don't ask a lot of Trekkies about it because it can get a bit contentious whether or not Starfleet is a military, but they go out and explore the galaxy, uh, doing missions, str strange new worlds, yada, yada, yada. You know all that stuff. Their other goal, at least Captain Kirk's goal, is to bone as many aliens as possible. All this power surging and throbbing, yet under control. Are you like that, Captain? I mean, like, it's Gene Roddenberry's vision. Gene Roddenberry was all about the boning. It, it, it was the thing. It was the thing. Re read his stuff. Gene Roddenberry, a lot about sex. Girls are such delicious, sweet-smelling, wonderful things. I, I can still remember when they would, they, they, when they would be so clean and their hair done, their starch dresses, and and how when they would uh, bend over, the dresses would come up and that they. You'd see the panties and, and it, uh... So that's the 1960s show that takes place, you know, in the 23rd century. About, 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 about kind of the middle, kind of the middle of the 23rd century. Now, what I'm going to do for this timeline is I'm gonna put the shows and movies and different media up at the top here, and then I'm gonna use this bottom space to sort of point out big events that take place during these times for all of you to know, just to figure out like the major timeline of stories that happen within Star Trek. Now, when it comes to Star Trek, the original series, there's not like a ton of major events that are occurring in this time because the show was very episodic. Like, it was like, oh, we're gonna go to this planet and bone these people, and we're gonna go to this civilization and, and meet this metaphor for humanity, uh, and talk about something about the racism, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. So it's not like a bunch of big events that you need to know going into the rest of Star Trek to understand. You can just watch an episode, it'll be fine. You'll learn a little bit about humanity. It'll be a bit problematic and, and the treatment of women won't be great, but you can kind of get the idea. The three visitors. There is one called McCoy. 
I wish him to remain here as my mate. But there are a couple important things to note that happened during the original series. The first is we get to meet the Romulans. Now the Romulans are basically like, think think kind of, at least in this era, kind of Romans in space. They like to talk about like praetors and, and honor and all that jazz. Obedience, duty, death and more death. Soon even enough for the praetor's test. Centurion, I find myself wishing for destruction before we can return. It also makes me wonder if there was like a lot of like Roman gay sex going on in Romulus. I really hope so. Like I really, really hope so. But what we learn is towards the end of the 22nd century, Earth and Romulus, as before the Federation was even born and created, there was a big Romulan um, Earth war where we all fought each other, hate each other, big racism, a lot of fun stuff. So we have our Earth Romulan war. Basically, we fight, no one really wins. Again, we'll be coming back to it. The next major event that happens during the original series is we meet the giant time-space donut, otherwise known as the Guardian of Forever. I am the Guardian of Forever. Most Trekkies just call him Giant Space Donut. Come on. Basically, Time Space Donut says like, hey, yo, uh, I can mess with time. Kirk and Spock go back in time at one point and kill a girl and uh, stop World War, actually stop World War II from happening. It's a whole thing. Uh, it's very sad, emotional. Go watch the episode. It, 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 it's good. Do you know what you just did? He knows, Doctor. He knows. Now, the last major event I want to talk about at this point in the timeline is this guy named Khan. The USS Enterprise crew come across a ship called the Botany Bay floating around in space carrying this guy named Khan and a bunch of his compatriots. Turns out Khan is this dude from the 21st century, or actually 20th century, 20th century, who took part in something called the Eugenics Wars. I've never been afraid. But you left at the very time mankind needed courage. We offered the world order. Now, technically, the Eugenics Wars, because the show was written in the 1960s, were assumed to be happening in the 1980s. And the Eugenics Wars were basically this time in human history where people cared a lot about human genetics, apparently, and wanted to separate people out by their different genetics and races and kind of create these different kind of states based on different people's genetics, which is such a weird, crazy sci-fi idea and totally not something happening today. Uh, it wasn't predicted by by a 60s show. There was little else left on Earth. There was the war to end tyranny. Many considered that a noble effort. Tyranny, sir? Or an attempt to unify humanity? Unify, sir? Like a team of animals under one whip? It's kind of blurry whether they actually happened, but Khan was a dude who fought in that war and to escape Earth when he lost, put himself into cryogenic sleep, launched himself into space. Kirk and Spock and everyone meet him and they're like, nah, bro, we're not about that eugenics nonsense anymore. That's stupid stuff. Uh, and so they uh, decide to abandon him on a planet and never come back and check on him again. Because that's apparently how the 23rd century does justice. Would be interesting, Captain, to return to that world in a hundred years and learn what crop had sprung from the seed you planted today. Yes, Mr. Spock. It would indeed. Evolved humanity aside, we have this ship called the Defiant, which is a ship that looks just like the USS Enterprise for budgetary reasons, but they encounter these people called Athelians. It's not really important, but just keep in mind that this was a ship called the Defiant that looked just like Enterprise, and because of yada 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 1960s stuff, the ship disappeared, and we don't know where it went, but we will be coming back to it. So we have the USS Defiant disappearing at some point in this timeline. Okay, so that's the that starts with the original series. But next up, we have this show called Star Trek The Animated Series. Hey, this glass just leaked all over me. How do you like that? So did mine. And mine? It appears we're all victims of a rather bizarre coincidence. Which is basically, basically like the original show, just all the same, except for way more low budget, a uh, lot of reused animations, and a hell of a lot crazier. I've just picked up my clean uniforms from the service shoot, and when I put this one on, I discovered this. The show has griffins. 
There's griffins in the animated series. Like, how does that not make Star Trek better? I'm all here for the Star Trek griffins. I want them in my live action Star Trek. Oh yeah, let's move to the aviary, he says. It'll be so quiet, he says. It's not a ton of important stuff happens in Star Trek the Animated Series. I mean, the crew meets the devil at one point. Who are you? Call me Lucien. Call me friend. Never could I abandon those who come to rollick with me. But not up here. No, no. Let us leave this vessel and go where true delights lie. <laughs> Also, Spock goes back in time and kills his pet dog at one point. Loss of life is to be mourned, but only if the life was wasted. My child's was not. It's a whole, like, character building thing. It's not creepy and serial killery at all, I swear to God. Um, eh, actually kind of is a little bit. I know there is pain. I can help a little. Sleep now. Regardless, we're gonna ignore that. But the only thing you really need to remember about Star Trek the Animated Series, the most important thing to remember about the show, is in one episode, Spock gets cloned. But not only does he get cloned, he gets cloned to be a 600 tall foot version of himself. And we call this guy Spock 2. The salvation of a galaxy, Spock 2. <laughs> Now he is insanely important. He is essentially Spock in all respects, except for he's 600 foot. And at the end of the episode, he's still alive. So there's just a giant Spock roaming around on this planet, uh, just living his best Vulcan life, which is uh, cool. And he gets to name named Spock too, which it doesn't all sound belittling. I mean, if I was the si if I was the giant 600 foot Spock, I'd be like, no, I am Spock A. You can be Spock too. Now you'd think we'd be done with this part of the timeline of Star Trek, but. <laughs> Evan help ya. No, we're not. Not even close. So while most of the Star Trek shows after this point take place further in the timeline, I'm gonna stick here in the 23rd century because we have a little show called Star Trek Discovery. Some people will say Star Trek Discovery doesn't count. We hate it. It counts. It's all Star Trek. We're gonna put it on the timeline. It's gonna be fun. We're gonna get in here. Yeah! Star Trek Discovery is a show that's actually currently still going on as the time of recording this video. So it actually is kind of like a prequel of sorts to the original series, except for like the technology is better and like they have holodecks, which by the way, we will be getting to holodecks in just a little bit. That's fun. But technically holodecks weren't created until the 24th century, if you ask some fans, or they also appeared in the animated series for some fans. But Star Trek Discovery kind of goes right here right before the sexist Kirk. By the way, Star Trek Discovery has a lot of women characters. It's awesome. And apparently between like here and there, uh, Star Tra Starfleet creates a whole thing where like women can't become captains, which is like, it's like a whole thing. Your world of starship captains doesn't admit women. For some reason, there was like an anti-feminist revolution between the time of Discovery, which takes place like 20 years before Kirk and Captain Kirk's time because, whew, uh, treatment of women. Very different between the two of those. Yes, sir, I have, but... but... You want to see the Captain Discovery? I do too. I'm also now just realizing as I put this up that like I didn't segment this well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna shift all this stuff. Big spot goes there. Anyways, Star Trek Discovery. Big important thing that you need to know about Star Trek Discovery is we follow the ship, the USS Discovery. It, big 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 ship, big honking ship. Big thing with that is it's powered by mushrooms. Oh yeah, no yeah I. I it's not a joke. I'm not saying they all get high on it. Well, maybe they get high. It'd be kind of fun if they all got high. <laughs> Damn. The whole thing is that it can traverse the galaxy instantaneously at any point in traveling a mushroom superhighway. This is Star Trek. We love it. It's a whole thing. If you're telling me that this ship can skip across the universe on a highway made of mushrooms, I kind of have to go in faith. Warp makes no sense either, folks. Let's all just admit it. They just, just, people go to, in space. But anyways, Mushroom Superhighway with Star Trek Discovery, that can, it can jump around. The other the big thing that we get with Star Trek Discovery is we learn that there is a Klingon war that happens during this time. Yeah, so not only do we have a Romulan war, 
Not only do we have a eugenics war, we also have a Klingon war happening right at this time. It's a whole thing. The only thing you really need to know about the Klingon war is it lasts about one year and we do learn one very important piece of Star Trek canon from this part of the series in Star Trek Discovery. And that important piece of information is uh, that Klingons most definitely have two penises. Oh yeah, this is one of the most important pieces of canon information that all of you need to know if you're going to be a Trekkie. Klingons have two penises. You see, in Star Trek The Next Generation, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, we learn that Klingons have redundant organs, like they have two hearts, like four lungs, things like that. The Klingons refer to it as the Brock Low. Almost every vital function in their bodies has a built-in redundancy in case any primary organ or system fails. Which naturally led many Trekkies to ask the question that many of us wanted to know was, how many dicks do they got? And in the background of one episode of Star Trek Discovery, we see a Klingon peeing against the wall, pictured here, and that Klingon exactly. has two streams. So clearly, Klingons got two dicks. And, and in case you're wondering, one on top of the other, not side to side. And naturally though, this raises so many more fascinating questions. Like for example, do Klingons born with vaginas have two vaginas? What is a redundant vagina? Are there intersex Klingons born with like one penis or like three penises? Do Klingons assign gender roles based on penises like we do in human society? Are people look down upon if they have three penises versus one? Or does having like one penis mean like, oh, you're a real badass for only going on and having one penis? And so like, is that like a, a sacred position in society? Why do Klingons have sex with other species. Is that like is it like a fun thing? I could see it being a fun thing. Definitely honorable. Definitely honorable. But regardless, this is a piece of Star Trek canon that definitively needed to be known at this time. Also, one of the main characters on Star Trek Discovery is actually the adoptive sister of Spock. And because of that, Spock does appear in Star Trek Discovery and definitively answered another question, or at least something that we all kind of knew, and that's the fact that uh, Spock looks much better with a beard. I mean, look at that. Look at that sexy beard. Clearly, clearly, Vulcans look sexier with beards. I like science. Look at that. Look at that sexy Spock. That's sexy. Speaking of Vulcans with beards, though, you can't base your ideas off of, like, one instance. Like, maybe, maybe this is just a flip. Maybe sexy Spock with a beard is just a one-off. And here I am to tell you that, no, that is not the case, because we have other versions of Spock with beard, and that is the Mirror Universe Spock. So here's where we get into some really, really fun stuff. So I'm gonna stick up this here, because apparently we meet in the original series, there is an entire other universe that is split off from our universe, kind of just like runs completely parallel to our universe down here. Now Star Trek likes to call this the mirror universe because it parallels our universe in a lot of different ways. This should be good. This is supposed to be an alternate universe, but their Captain O'Brien seems as nice as our Chief O'Brien. So, don't you see? It doesn't make any sense. It's not alternate. However, what I am going to call it is the evil, bisexual, blue eyeshadow universe. Because in this universe, everyone's evil, bisexual, and or wears blue eyeshadow. You do know that he's gay, right? Don't be so binary. In my universe, he was pansexual, and we had DEFCON level fun together. Which, I, I guess being bisexual and, and wearing blue eyeshadow makes you evil. So I don't know what kind of bisexual person would wear blue eyeshadow all the time. And in this universe, all Vulcans apparently need to have goatees. It's like a weird fashion thing. It kind of goes along with the blue eyeshadow for some reason. But the Enterprise crew visits this mirror universe uh, at least one time, uh, and it's very sexy. It's very sexy, even though there's a lot of there's a lot of fascism. It's a, it's a very fascisty, but. The goatees are nice. Also, the crew of the Discovery visit the Mirror Universe at one point. There's like one of their captains is from the Mirror It's a whole thing. It's a big twist and, and ultimately kind of went nowhere, but was kind of cool. But we may meet this awesome badass named Empress Giorgio who ruled the Terran Empire. She was like, she killed people. She literally ate alien species. She ate Kelpians, which we'll be talking about. No one prepares Kelpian like the Imperial chef. Here, have my ganglia. Portable human being. So naturally, she comes over to our universe and we treat her like a good person. You are my Philippa. Michael. I mean, what I feel for you belongs to you. No one else. You deserve a treat. Oh. 
Now we'll be coming back to the evil bisexual blue eyeshadow universe in just a little bit, but just know that it's it's kind of there and we, we visit it from time to time in, in these universes. One other thing that I should mention in the 23rd century, I swear to God we're gonna be getting out of here right now, is there is another show coming out called Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which kind of takes place right in between Star Trek Discovery and the original series, and it's about Captain Pike, who is uh, my daddy, in whatever way you want to take that, sexual or not, he's my daddy. Um, and uh, he was basically running the Enterprise before Kirk and was a thousand times better and awesome. Arg, me mates. If we ever catch Angel, we should make them walk the plank, Arg. Please stop. Yeah, he also likes horses, because horses are cool. Which is why it's kind of sad that Pike's ultimate fate is to end up in an accident that will leave him in a BB chair that'll leave him only able to say one beep for yes, two beeps for no, and completely forget Morse code for some reason. Okay, so now you would think we're done with the 23rd century, but <laughs> we're still not done. So let's kind of run through the rest of the 23rd century going on here. And actually, I just realized I'm gonna need more room, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna erase that. We're gonna move. This is, this is something Star Trek does. It just kind of plays willy-nilly with the timeline. So we're gonna move the, the 23rd century will probably be, we'll go to like 23rd century. Kind of, kind of right there. So now we're in the movie era of this timeline. So after after Star Trek, the original series ends, you know, the crew kind of like goes their separate ways for a bit, you know, Kirk, Spock, everyone. But then they meet up again a few years later in Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, basically the crew meets a giant space vagina, um, enter it. I intend to calculate thruster ignition and acceleration rate to coincide with the opening of the major orifice. This should facilitate a better view of the interior of the alien spacecraft. Turns out the space vagina is actually um, a NASA probe, and uh, they leave. So, that's Star Trek the motion picture, giant space vagina. Gene Roddenberry, folks. I have successfully penetrated the next chamber of the alien's interior. Then, we get Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. Khan! Uh, Star Trek of the Wrath of, in Star Trek of the Wrath of Khan, Khan, this dude, kind of rightfully pissed off that he was abandoned on a planet and left for dead. You lie! And see the Alpha 5 there was life! A fair chance! This is Seti Alpha 5! Kinda gets angry at Kirk, and comes back and tries to get revenge on Kirk. Kirk yells, Khan! Khan! They fight a little bit, and, uh, Spock dies. So, uh, that's cool. That, that, that's Wrath of Khan. Then, because Spock is like the most important thing in all of Star Trek, we have the movie The Search for Spock, where the crew uh, realizes that Spock has come back from the dead because Star Trek is totally scientifically accurate. Uh, they have his Vulcan soul, again, scientifically accurate. They shove it back in his body. It's all well and good. Also, the other big thing to remember about Star Trek The Search for Spock is that uh, a Klingon, who is basically Doc Brown in blackface, and he kills Kirk's son uh, and makes Kirk really racist against Klingons. They're animals, Jim. There is an historic opportunity here. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. They are dying. Let them die. Now, naturally, the movie that follows this really in-depth soul-searching spot coming back to life, Kirk's son dying, a soul for a soul, all this in-depth introspective stuff, the movie after that uh, is about going back in time and saving some whales. Because... Totally consistent. Yeah, apparently a giant probe appears over Earth and demands to speak to whales for some reason. No one really asked why. It was just a thing that happened. Because apparently, way back towards the end of the 21st century, all the whales died uh, because of some weird natural uh, disaster where humanity just hunted them to extinction because we stopped caring about the environment and Earth nearly got destroyed and imploded. It's a good thing that Star Trek's fiction though, right? I mean, like, this is clearly this wasn't, Star Trek didn't predict anything at all going on on this part of the timeline. Whales! We saved the whales. We bring them, we bring them, we bring them to the 23rd century and whales are back. Admiral, 
there be whales here. Yay! Then in the next Star Trek movie, Star Trek The Final Frontier, the crew literally meets God. Is this the voice of God? One voice, many faces. Yeah. Literally meets God. You are the first to me. We sought only your infinite wisdom. Um. So yeah, that's a thing that happens in Star Trek, and uh, no one ever talks about it again. Literally meet God, and uh, no one, no one, no one gives a fuck. In fact, why, why do we even give? Shoo! No, no one cares. No one gives a shit that they met God. He, no, he was a giant floating face. No one gave a fuck. He wanted a starship. What does God need with a starship? What does God need with a starship? And yeah, of course, it technically wasn't God, but I do like to point out the fact that Kirk met both the devil and God, and the devil was cooler. A favorite old Earth custom of mine, Asmodeus. A toast to a new friendship. That's canonical. The devil is cooler than God. Also, Spock has more family members. He has a half-brother that appears in that movie. Then the final movie of this era is we have Star Trek The Undiscovered Country. Big thing to know with this movie is uh, the Klingon's moon blows up. It's called Praxis. It just does kind of an explodey thing, you know, like moons do. And this really fucks up the Klingon Empire. So they're like, yo, we need to become friends with the humans now or else we're kind of boned. And Kirk's like, hey, you kind of killed my son. It was, I'm not really cool with that. And they're like, but, but come on, but come on. And then Kirk's like, oh, fine, I'll stop being racist. And that's Star Trek VI. You've restored my father's faith. And you've restored my son's. Also in Star Trek VI, uh, Red from that 70s show is the president of the Federation, so keep that in mind. Just someone, someone decided that the best man to lead the uh, future of humanity was was a guy who wants to put a shoe up your ass. How'd you like to own a little bit of my foot in your ass? <laughs> to be fair, I could get behind that diplomatic policy. So that's basically everything that happens in the 23rd century. Now, I kind of want to go a little bit further in depth with some of the species that we meet in the 23rd century. So let me explain some of the alien races in the 23rd century that you need to know. The first are Klingons. Basically their whole deal is they have a whole empire. They're sort of a big rival to the Federation, all about honor. They like fighting people being like, ah, for honor, ah, I want honor. That's, that's basically the Klingons. A shame, Captain. It would have been glorious. We also have the Vulcans. Spock is a Vulcan. Everyone's heard of Spock. They got the pointy ears. Everyone in the Federation is a little bit racist towards Vulcans. They kind of make fun of their pointy ears, call them devil a lot, making fun of the fact that they don't have emotions. And yet everyone's kind of fine with it. Is there anyone on this ship who even remotely looks like Satan? I am not aware of anyone who fits that description, Captain. Like, quite literally, there are dozens of episodes across the entire franchise that just end on everyone sort of laughing casually, doing racist remarks against Vulcans, and everyone's just kind of cool with it, including, including the Vulcans. Now tell me, did you happen to make any comment about those ears? Not specifically, but I did get the distinct impression she found them the most attractive human characteristic of all. I didn't have the heart to tell her that only I have... She really liked those ears? Captain, I see no reason to stand here and be insulted. So... Yay, evolved humanity! But the whole thing with Vulcans is they have no emotions, or well, they have emotions, but they don't really show it, and, and they kind of bury it deep down. Also, they only have sex every seven years. I've been doing research on human sex. <laughs> what? which is a very important thing uh, in, in this franchise. Just Vulcans only have sex every seven years. They don't like to talk about it, but boy, do they talk about it. There's no need to be uh, embarrassed about it, Mr. Spock. It happens to the birds and the bees. The birds and the bees are not Vulcans, Captain. 
Also, we have the Romulans. We'll talk a little bit more about the Romulans in a little bit when it comes to the 24th century, so we'll, we'll be coming back to them. They're a little bit more interesting there. Also, in the 23rd century, we have the Orions, which are basically just people painted green. Sexy people, uh, pirates, but don't call them that because it's a bit offensive. Star Trek likes to monoculture aliens a lot and saying like, oh, all these aliens are like this one thing, but then later on that gets brought up, like this character Tendi that's pictured here, she's like, don't call of us pirates, even though the whole show has kind of been saying that they're pirates. Stop! It is not my whole thing. And for your information, many Orions haven't been pirates for over five years! So now I'm feeling kind of offensive about that fact, but I also need to kind of talk about the fact that they're mostly slavers and pirates. So like, here I am being kind of racist, but also just staying it. And now I'm just sort of like, oh my God, I am basically saying stereotypes are true for real. Arr, how you be doing today, me fellow Orion? Uh, why are you talking like that? Allergies. Reason, I'm a terrible person. I'm problematic. This should be, uh, cancel me. Please ca cancel me for this. Cancel me for this. This is why I get canceled because I was offensive to the Orions. The only other alien race you kind of need to know in the 23rd century on this board is we've got the Kelpians who are anxiety made manifest. Their whole deal is they're afraid all the damn time. Also they can sense death maybe, which is kind of weird. We kind of forget about that aspect after a few episodes. They, they, they talk about like, we can sense the coming of death. We were biologically determined for one purpose and one purpose alone to sense the coming of death. Which is like, are you, are you like God? Cause we met God. And even, even he couldn't sense the coming of death. He just wanted a starship. So like, are Kelpians gods? Uh, also played by Doug Jones, who's amazing. He's also daddy, but in a very different way from Pike. Like he's a daddy who I actually want to be my daddy. Whereas Pike is a daddy who I want to be my daddy. I think I missed the beard. Yeah, I, I felt like I belonged to a different era of captain. But that's what you were going for, man at a time. All right, now we are finally done with the 23rd century. It is time to get to the 24th century, which actually now I need to realize, like, because I screwed up my whole timeline here, let's just fix this, fix this up. This is kind of what Star Trek does a lot of the time, where it's just like, oh yeah, we realized that we fucked up our timeline a little bit. So uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna forget some stuff and uh, just no one's gonna no one's gonna reference it unless you're a YouTuber online and uh, want to complain about stuff nonsense bullshit. 24th century. So in the 24th century, as I fall over, we have these three shows: Star Trek: The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Also a few other ones. We'll get to them in just a second. But these are kind of the main ones to talk about, at least at first. And they kind of happen in that general order. Next generation happens first. It's about like a hundred years after this. So like kind of the kind of the middle of the 24th century. Like Klingons are our friends now. We're bros. That's a whole thing. Then like during the middle of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine starts. We'll get to that. Voyagers after the Next Generation ends. So that's kind of like the order. It all kind of takes place in this melange of the 24th century. Before we get into the 24th century, let's talk about some of the aliens of the 24th century so you can kind of get an idea of where things are set up in the timeline. All right, back to this board for more aliens that you need to know. So we talked earlier about the Romulans. In the 24th century, they become a little bit different. They're basically super, super paranoid all the time. I assure you I intended no deception. Of course not. You doubt my good faith? Basically, all Romulans at this point become like super suspicious of everybody. They're basically like secret police. They're all just like, oh, I don't trust you. Maybe you're dangerous. Mm. That's that, that's my impression of the Romulans, apparently. They're, that, that's what they do. It seems this time you are the one who has made an aggressive move across the neutral zone. Commander Tomaluk. As I'm sure you already know, we were responding to warnings of Romulan incursions at Nelvana 3. Uh, but Captain, as you can see, there is no incursion. Also, we have Q. Welcome back, Q. It's a pleasure to see you again, my old friend. We're not friends. You wound me, mon capitaine. Basically imagine Loki, like if Loki was in Star Trek and just like judged humanity a lot of the time and just kind of popped in doing whatever the hell he wants whenever he wants because he's basically a god and can just like snap his fingers and go everywhere. That's cute. That's what he does. Basically just likes to come in and fuck with people, which, you know, I'm kind of here for. Anytime there's a Q episode, I'm, I'm down for it. Unless it's an episode where he's like being weirdly misogynistic towards Janeway. I never did anything like that for Jean-Luc, but I feel very close to you. 
I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because you have such authority and yet manage to preserve your femininity so well. Leave. So, which is a thing. There's a lot of misogyny in Star Trek, so just you're gonna have to kind of roll with that for a while. Also, at this point in the timeline, Klingons are kind and, and like friends with the Federation. They're still about honor and all that nasty stuff, but nasty stuff. What honor is nasty? Whatever. Um, they're but the Klingons are cool now. They're bros. Basically, Klingons go from being enemies to like being our bros over the course of a hundred years. Next up, we have the Borg. The existence as you know it is over. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. The Borg are ooh scary Borg. Ooh. Basically, if you're a fan of Star Trek and and you've gotten past Vulcans, you're gonna know about Borg. They're giant space zombies that like go around making other space zombies super into geometry, like really into geometry. Like they've got their basic shapes down and they go around getting other people super into geometry and make them other space zombies like that. I won't get into this, but several of the characters throughout the different shows get turned into Borg, get turned back to Borg. It's a whole like metaphor for trauma and PTSD and it's very deep, very thoughtful. Also, they look like they evolved from like a weird iPhone. Like they, like they had sex with an iPhone. So now let's talk about some of the events of the 24th century, starting with the stuff that happens in the next generation. So at one point Q, that dude who was like the Loki guy from on the other side, he is sort of like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fuck with Picard because he and Picard are fuck buddies, but they don't admit it. You matter to me. Even gods have favorites, your Luke. Q sort of flings the Enterprise across the galaxy to the Delta Quadrant with the Borg hangout uh, and sends them to meet the Borg, which gets the Borg like hella interest in the Federation. The Borg are like, oh, you're cool. You're kind of pretty. I'd like, to, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. Life flows slowly and quietly Like my soul is flying in the sky above too many things have happened on my way here Too many ways to live my only life To feel so good and bad Something great and very sad Sometimes you want to run away from here Feels like the last day of your life And the so that has been done but you didn't have the time to see it through. despite you fall Systems. They will be coming. Was that good for you? Ooh. Look at you with your cute little bald Picard face and your little federation and your little technology. We just want to assimilate you. Yes, we do. How would you like to be the Borg? Yes, you would. Yes, you would. So the Borg decide to invade the Federation, and they do so by making Picard one of the Borg, and he becomes Locutus of Borg. I am Locutus of Borg. Which makes him the cutest of Borg. I mean, look at that face. Look at that cute little Borg face. <gasps> Sleep, Data. He's exhausted. Anywho, the Federation staves off the first Borg invasion. The Borg are like, ah, we'll be back, though. You're just too cute. You're just too adorable for us not to assimilate yet. Yes, you are. We want to assimilate you, Federation. I know we need each other. I know our love is strong. But anyways, this battle was called the Battle of Wolf 359. Uh, big important battle. Picard was traumatized by it, yada yada yada. But also during this pro during this battle, uh, Cisco, who was the captain of Deep Space Nine, which is the space station that we'll be getting to in just a little bit, he uh, lost his wife in that battle. He's kind of all butthurt against Picard about it. It was a whole thing. We met in battle. I was on the Saratoga at Wolf 359. 
but they never really talk about it again because they only meet once. But his wife dies. It's very sad. Fridged his wife. Always very fun to see a fridging of a woman in a series. So that happens. The other major thing that happens during the next generation is we learn that Spock is still alive a hundred years later. We don't really know about what the hundred folks Spock's doing, but regular Spock, he is uh, sort of hanging around and he realizes that the Romulans are actually an offshoot of the Vulcans. Like, they, they, they used to exist on one planet, but then Romulans were like, nah, bro, we're getting super suspicious of everything. Like, we're getting kind of paranoid, so we're gonna just, like, jet out of here. And so they leave uh, and uh, form their own planet and their own civilization, and they're less about logic and more about, like, being suspicious of folks. Um, and so Spock decides, like, hey, we, we're brothers. I want to reconcile, like, I, I'm all about, like, a reconciling emotional and logical sides of, of myself. So let's do that in, like, a metaphorical way with civilizations. And so he forms the unification movement, which is trying to reunite the Romulans and the Vulcans. Which, if that actually ever happens, which we'll get to in just a little bit, would be one of the most important things in Star Trek. And I want to you to keep that in mind. If the Vulcans and the Romulans ever got together and ever formed a civilization, super, super big thing for everybody. Keep that in mind, because that's going to get us to our most important alien in just a little bit. Oh, the last really important thing to mention within The Next Generation, because again, episodic show, weird stuff happens. Um, at one point, Fraser shows up um, in a time loop. Like, literally, Fraser just, like, uh, comes, like, he's from the 23rd, apparently Fraser exists in the 23rd century, and he just, like, gets sent to the, the 24th century and causes, like, a weird time loop where the Enterprise keeps blowing up. Now, Star Trek fans like to call that event the Fraser Loop. So we're just going to put that there. That there is the Fraser Loop. Very important event in Star Trek. Fraser comes to the 24th century and just brings his uh, casual callousness and sarcasm and wit to the 24th century, which I think we all can enjoy. Can we possibly use sex to get what we want? Sex is what we want! Captain, have you any idea what has just happened? I'm in a bathrobe, you jackass! But this brings us finally to Deep Space Nine. Now, before we get into Deep Space Nine, we also need to go back to the other board to talk about some races that are important for Deep Space Nine. <laughs> All right, back to this board because we've got a few more 24th century aliens that we need to talk about. Also in the 24th century, we have the Ferengi. Now, the Ferengi are basically capitalism made manifest. You embezzled money from the Nagus? Surprise. Father would be proud. <laughs> they have all these rules of acquisitions. They're all about greed. They always want to acquire money. They're always like, Meh, we want to get money. Meh. This is what it came in. They start off super, super stupid and super, super dumb. Kind of like capitalism. You kind of want to laugh at it and they're kind of like weirdly sexual. <sighs> Am I doing it right? You don't have to be quite so gentle. <sighs> But as you get into it and you get to know the friend, you're like, oh, you're actually kind of adorable when you're not being, in fact, when you are problematic, you're even more adorable. What's wrong with my walk? You're lumbering. Uh, this is never going to work. Don't cry, brother. Here, let me show you. Watch carefully. You see, it's more of a glide. That's good. And the Ferengi basically kind of proved that capitalism works best when it's done just for comedy in episodes guest starring Iggy Pop. Your people have a reputation for cunning. I see that it's well earned. Perhaps one day, the Ferengi will take their place as valued members of the Dominion. Anything's possible. So, Star Trek knows where it's at when it comes to making fun of capitalism. The other group that we have are the Cardassians, which are basically just, they're, they're space fascists. This trial is to demonstrate the futility of behavior contrary to good order. Everyone will find it most uplifting. Not everyone. Once again, justice will be done. Our lives will be reaffirmed, safe and secure. Here on Cardassia, all crime are solved. All criminals are punished. All endings are happy. Even the poorest of our subjects can walk the streets in the dead of night in perfect safety. You're only one man, but your conviction will be a salutary experience for millions. Like super into fascism. 
super into it, like all about the state, all about great. Also, there's like a racial slur against them called Spoonheads, but don't say that because it's kind of offensive. But a lot of people say it kind of a lot, especially O'Brien. If you've killed one of the Spoonheads. Spoonheads. Correct. At least Keiko calls him out on it a few times. Gentle was bred out of these Cardassians a long time ago. You know, that was a very ugly thing you just said. I only said- I don't need to hear it twice. But basically, the, this fascism metaphor, they at one point uh, sort of occupied the planet of Bajor. These guys right here with like the weird crinkly noses, which is like one of a billion alien races in Star Trek with weird crinkly noses, but these are the most important crinkly nose aliens that we have in Star Trek. Because these folks, they fought like really, really hard against the Cardassians. It was like a whole thing. It was a lot of like they, 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 they pulled it out. Like they, they got them out of there. And so after the the fascism metaphor leave uh, their planet, the Bajorans uh, then ask the Federation for help. And so the Federation comes in and is like, "Yeah, we'll be your best bros." And they're like, they're super religious, which can be kind of a little bit weird at times. But it's like kind of like nice too. They're like really cool and like scrappy. And, and I really love the, the Bajorans are just, the Bajorans are fucking awesome. Let's just be honest. You think I have time for anything other than resisting? Fighting fascism is a full-time job! <laughs> now, whenever you have fascism, you're gonna have Antifa. Uh, so in Star Trek, our Antifa is the Maquis. The Maquis are basically a bunch of Starfleet people that were like, hey, fascism, bad actually and maybe we shouldn't just be okay with fascism just existing and signing treaties with them maybe we should actually be like nah nah fuck fascism we're gonna stop that so a whole bunch of starfleet officers like leave starfleet and form the maquis and they basically go around doing border skirmishes against the cardassians and and kind of fight them i thought that i could do it even though it meant helping the cardassians even though it meant betraying people who were fighting against them Now I'm not sure where I stand. They weren't perfect, some of their tactics? Not great, not good. But think about those people you saw in the caves. Huddled and starving, they didn't attack the Malinche. You should have thought about that before you attacked a Federation starship. But, uh, lucky you were right. One other race to mention in the 24th century are the Trill. The whole thing with Trill is they're basically the same exact thing as humans, except for some Trill get little slugs put in their body and the slugs give them memories of their past lives, which many trans people re relate to because we're sort of like, oh yeah, I like have, a, have like a life like that too. If it makes things any easier, think of me as a man. I've been one several times. <laughs> And like, so a lot of like trails were like used to be dudes in their past life, some were women in their past lives, but are different genders now. So there's like a whole metaphor, trans people, then just know trans people love the shit out of the trails. Like they're our favorites, they, we claim them. Trans people claim these. So, you know what, I'm taking this one down. You don't, you don't even get to see the trail. They're ours, our thing. This is trans, trail, our tr trail is trans culture, our thing. Basically what you need to know with Deep Space Nine is that the Cardassians, the fascism metaphor that I mentioned on the other side, they leave the planet Bajor and the Federation comes in, like I said, and says like, hey, we're bros, we're gonna help you. And at that same time, at that exact moment, we find a wormhole right by Bajor that connects our side of the galaxy to the other side of the galaxy, the Gamma Quadrant, which is, again, it's a whole other side of the galaxy. The Gamma Quadrant, 70,000 light years from Bajor, I'd say we just found our way into a wormhole. It's not like any wormhole I've ever seen. There were none of the usual resonance waves. Could this be how the orbs found their way into the Bajoran system? Not an unreasonable hypothesis. If it's true, that would mean that this has been here for 10,000 years. Dex, we might have just discovered the first stable wormhole known to exist. Bring us about, Lieutenant. So the Federation's in control of this wormhole and they're sort of like, yeah, we're gonna start trading with all those people, it'll be great. Now at the same time, the Cardassians, the fascism metaphor, they're kind of being shitty. So they're, they're sort of mucking about and it gets a little bit murky morally. It's a whole thing, it's a whole thing. But also through the wormhole, we meet the group, the Dominion, which I'll talk about over on the other side of the board. So back to this board, when the Federation goes through that wormhole, they reach an area of the galaxy known as the Gamma Quadrant, which is like the other side of the galaxy. The only major thing that you need to know about the Gamma Quadrant is there is a group there called the Dominion. The Dominion is basically the Federation just 
evil. Uh. And all about like justice and order. So many years ago, we set ourselves the task of imposing order on a chaotic universe. Is that what you call it, imposing order? I call it murder. What you call it is no concern of ours. Kind of also a fascism metaphor. Like they align, like these, the, the fascism metaphor and like the, 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 the alt-right kind of join together at different points throughout the series. You know, there's no metaphor or politics in Star Trek. The thing to know about the Dominion is there are three basic races to keep in mind with the Dominion. You have the Changelings, which are the people in charge of everything. The Changelings are liquid people. They can change their shape and form, kind of shapeshiftery kind of people. They're all about like everyone who's solid sucks. They're different than us. We don't like them. We want them all to either be subjugated or lesser than us. You get the idea. They also have a bunch of warriors that they've addicted to cocaine, essentially, that fight for them. Basically, they genetically engineer these warriors, addict them to cocaine, and then they go fight their battles for them. We pledge our loyalty to the Founders from now until death. Then receive this reward from the Founders. May it keep you strong. very dark stuff, like super dark stuff. Also, there's the Vorta, um, who are these people that are kind of like the middle managers of the Dominion that kind of just go around trying to be all sleazy and kind and some people are like, oh, look, they're kind of cool and they know how to talk to people, but really they just talk really fast and are kind of jerks and just kind of justify horrible atrocities in the nicest, kindest way possible, most palatable way possible. You and I are reasonable men and surely reasonable men can come to some sort of mutually acceptable compromise. I didn't think the Dominion believed in compromise. It saddens me to see how deeply you misunderstand us. All the Dominion wants is to peacefully coexist with its neighbors. Then why the continued military buildup? Why the weekly convoys of ships and troops from the Gamma Quadrant? It's the Cardassians. Basically, they're like the like they're they're like the talk show hosts. In fact, I just sort of realized that I forgot to put up a picture of the Vorta on this board. So let me quick get my uh, my picture of the Vorta. Ah, oh, there's the Vorta. Get a good get a good shot of that. That's the that's the Vorta. So we got the Changelings, the Vorta, and the Jem'Hadar. There's no politics in Star Trek whatsoever. Don't know what you're talking about. So the Dominion team up with the Cardassians. They cause a war, and this is called called the Dominion War. Big whole thing, people got very upset. Uh, you know, it's not great. Everyone's very traumatized by it. Uh, it says Domain War, but we'll, we'll just call it Dominion War. Also, worth mentioning, during the Deep Space Nine timeline, we go back to the evil bisexual universe. We meet even more bisexuals that's pictured here. This is Kira, she's Mirror Kira, super bisexual, super evil, and she also wears blue eyeshadow from time to time. Say it like, like, what did I say? Evil, evil bisexual fascism universe. But in this universe, we learn that the Federation of that universe, the Terran Empire fell because it sucked and because Spock I uh, was like, nah, maybe this isn't a good idea. Maybe fascism bad, actually, which is good, but that causes other powers to be like, but still fascism cool, and then sort of takes over, and uh, the, the Klingons and Cardassians of that universe sort of team up, take over the Terran Empire, and enslave all of humanity, which, like, eh, I don't really feel bad for humanity, but you kind of should, because no one deserves to be enslaved. Um, yeah, the Mirror Universe is kind of fucked up. It's a fucked up place. Still like the eyeshadow though. But then this brings us to Star Trek Voyager. Now Star Trek Voyager, what we learn in Star Trek Voyager is there's the ship aptly named Voyager that is sent out to capture some Maquis. There, there's a Maquis ship and it disappeared. So Voyager, we captain by Janeway here, um, great decision maker. She always makes the best decisions. No one questions her leadership at all at any point throughout the series. She uh, goes after them and uh, a Banjo Man, Banjo Man, uh, he takes her ship and sends it all the way to the Delta Quadrant, which is the other side of the galaxy that isn't the Gamma Quadrant. So there's like four quadrants, Delta Quadrant. So Banjo Man takes Janeway, shoves her to the other side of the universe, and Janeway's like, ah, crap, well, now I gotta work with the Maquis that are here too, and we're gonna head back home. It's gonna take a long time, and I'm gonna make some dubious decisions. Set a course for home. Speaking of dubious decisions of Janeway, let's talk about a few of those after we talk about some of the alien races that we encounter in the Delta Quadrant. 
All right, so one of the last times we're gonna come back to this board in the 24th century is we have the Voyager aliens. Like I said, the USS Voyager gets sent to the Delta Quadrant, which is the other side of the galaxy that isn't the Gamma Quadrant. It's the Delta Quadrant, it's very different. We have the Borg, the Borg are sort of the, the big baddies of the Delta Quadrant, they mainly control it. They sort of are infesting other people, making more people Borg, making more people space zombies, that's their whole deal. But there are a few other alien races within the Delta Quadrant that are worth mentioning. The first are the Kazon, which, Basically, the Kazon are like Klingons if you like tossed them in a trash bag and like beat them up for a little while. You know, she contradicts me in front of the senior Ascara. My own woman disputing her Marge in front of others. That's the Kazon. You really don't need to know anything else about the Kazon. They suck. The Kazon suck. You want me to kill a child in front of other children? What would it accomplish? It will teach these little boys an important lesson. And after you do that, you'll be free to go. The other alien race that we meet are the Herojin, which just think like, <laughs> they're poachers that are hunting the most dangerous game. And of course the most dangerous game is man, except for man is, is like all sentient species because it's not just like one alien race. It, it's everyone. I'm trying to create a future for my people. Future? I don't expect you to understand you are prey. You underestimate us. Yes. Perhaps I do. That's the Herojin. They, 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 they hunt people. It, it, it's, Soylent Green is people. That's, that's the Herojin. Soylent Green is people, what? It has nothing to do with anything. Whatever, we're moving on. And the only other like alien race that you need to know in, in Star Trek Voyager really, there's a couple others, but the really big one is uh, these guys, these are Species 8472. Basically they were there to just be an enemy for the Borg to like team up. There was like, oh look, there's an enemy that's even worse than the Borg. So Janeway has to team up with the Borg. Isn't it morally dubious? It's kind of interesting. State your proposal. Let's work together, combine our resources. Even if we do give you the technology now, you're still going to need time to develop it. By working together, we can create a weapon more quickly. And that's, that's them. They were kind of weird CGI horse people things. Kind of cool. I liked them. They can blow up planets. Oh, one other Voyager alien I forgot because who gives a crap? Uh, there's Talaxians. Um, Talaxians exist. Yep. So let's talk about Star Trek Voyager and some of the shenanigans that they get up over in there. So remember back at the beginning of the video, I talked about the sex salamanders? You thought I forgot about the sex salamanders. No, we didn't forget about the sex salamanders. Yeah, at one point, uh, Janeway and one of her crew members, Tom Paris, get turned into salamanders, and they uh, have little salamander babies. It's very important. Uh, and then they suddenly get turned back into humans and no one ever talks about it again. I've thought about having children. But I must say I never considered having them with you. Oh, Captain, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to say. Except... I don't remember very much about... Uh... You know. What makes you think it was your idea? So that happens. I guess this whole experience has left me feeling a little overwhelmed. Little salamander babies floating around the Delta Quadrant doing salamander shit. Like God. No one talks about the salamanders. Salamanders and God. We don't talk about it. Also, in the Delta Quadrant, we meet this guy called Tuvix. Yes, this is a really important guy. He, Tuvix was a great dude. You see, Tuvix was a, a combination of two different characters on the Voyager ship. Uh, they got beamed up and kind of got spliced together because the transporters are fucking strange technologies like weird shit happens with the transporter uh and everyone just says it's fine like people getting split up duplicated copied combined together all the time oh my god enterprise what we got back didn't live long fortunately 
But regardless, the best thing to ever come out of a transporter was clearly Tuvix. This guy was great. He was super kind, super thoughtful, knew how to cook well, but also knew his tactical stuff. I managed to correct it. Tuvok said it could take up to 10 days to check out all the possible problems. How'd you fix it so fast? I had a hunch. A hunch? That's correct. You'll have a report on your desk first thing this afternoon. Like one of the nicest dudes. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, so naturally Janeway murders him. Kills him dead. Against his will. It's actually very traumatic. Doesn't anyone see that this is wrong? Janeway is a great leader. All right, let's not, let's not dwell on that. Also, one of the Maquis members turns out to actually be a Cardassian in disguise because the Cardassians are like super into like pretending to be other races. In fact, everyone in Star Trek is kind of about that. Like humans pretend to be Klingons and like get Klingon face at some point and like pretend to be Orions at some point. Like there's a lot of cosmetic surgery with people being other races and it's kind of problematic. Honestly, this feels wrong. I mean, just please don't take any pictures of me. But no one really talks about it all that much. It, it, it's, it's, it, again, it's kind of fucked up. Anyways, one of the crew members turns out to be, um, her name's Seska. She, she's on the ship and she does all the like, uh, she's like spying around, she does stuff. Um, her whole thing is basically she's like a soap opera star in space. Like at one point she impregnates herself with Chakotay, the first officers of the ship's uh, DNA and, and makes a little soap opera baby. While you were unconscious, I took the liberty of extracting a sample of your DNA. I impregnated myself with it. So I guess more congratulations are in order. You're going to be a father. Star Trek! Um, but that's okay, because the baby gets taken um, and, and never gets talked about ever again in, in, in anything. In fact, that kind of happens a lot with Voyager. Like, lots of traumatic shit happens in Voyager, and we kind of just forget about it. Voyager hits the reset button a lot. Speaking of the reset button, we also have The Year of Hell, one of the best two-parter episodes in all of Star Trek, where basically Voyager enters this, like, timeline thing, where, like, these groups called the Krenum are trying to erase timeline pieces and things like that. It's all very complicated. A lot of time travel -y stuff goes on there. Um, it's, the Voyager gets battered all the hell, crew members die. It's very, it's, like, one of the best written things that Star Trek Voyager ever did. And, of course, because it's Voyager, uh, it all gets erased and, and, the, and it actually never really happened. <laughs> Captain's log, stardate 51252.3. Just kind of, year of hell. I'm gonna just put it on here and then erase it. Just, it's gone. It's gone, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Might as well never have happened, because it didn't. However, one thing that Janeway did do that actually stuck around and was the best thing that she ever did, legitimately, no joke, was uh, Seven of Nine. Seven of Nine was a Borg uh, that when they were fighting that species 8472 I was talking about on the other side of the board, they worked with the Borg and uh, Janeway tricked the Borg and actually uh, stole Seven of Nine and actually deborgified her and made her a member of the crew. And she was like awesome. Like Seven of Nine, great character, like talking about humanity and like trying to relearn how to be human. Fucking love Seven of Nine. The Borg believed I was unique. That I understood humanity. They were obviously mistaken. How so? I betrayed the crew of Voyager, threatened you with assimilation. I did not expect you to return for me. Looks like you still have a few things to learn. Best thing that ever happened uh, to Star Trek, in my opinion. Love her so much. However, getting back to terrible decisions of Janeway. <laughs> You see, like I said, Voyager had to travel 70 years to get home. It was going to be a very long journey. It's been a long road. But we learn in one episode that Janeway actually managed to get the ship back home in about like 30 years. Like really great. That's actually super impressive. Like Janeway did it. And she became, grew old, was back in the Federation. People were like nominally happy. Like some people died and like Tuvok or like second in command, he got kind of sick. But on the whole, it was actually pretty decent. But of course, Janeway couldn't handle that fact that she didn't succeed unilaterally and perfectly. So she goes back in time 
completely undoes the lives of everyone that's done that. In fact, you even see like people have wives, people are married, but no, she's like, fuck that. Who needs that? We're gonna actually go back in time, erase all of that. I'm gonna get Voyager back in seven fucking years. No, instead of like saying like, oh, we're gonna do it in three years. No, she's like, no, seven. Seven seems like a good like number of seasons. I mean, years to be trapped in the, in the Delta Quadrant. So we're gonna go back and do that because Janeway does not give a fuck about the timeline and says, fuck that. And so that's how Voyager gets home because Janeway says, fuck the timeline and, and just travels back in time to do that. I refuse to believe I'll ever become as cynical as you. Am I the only one experiencing deja vu here? What are you talking about? Seven years ago, you had the chance to use the caretaker's array to get Voyager home. Instead, you destroyed it. I did what I knew was right. You chose to put the lives of strangers ahead of the lives of your crew. Here seems like a natural jumping off point to talk about way further in the future, like the 27th, 28th century, because we're talking about time travel. So what we learn in Voyager, because Jamie likes to fuck with the timeline a lot of people, we actually get to meet the time cops in Star Trek. You see, in the 27th century, so several years ahead, the Federation basically becomes time cops. They don't explore just space, they explore time. And so we have the, uh, the time cops, and we meet like Captain Braxton and stuff. He fucking hates Janeway is to obliterate Voyager from the timeline. That way, none of the events that caused this illness will have occurred. What events? 30 years of exile on 20th century Earth. The temporal inversion in the Takara sector. Three violations that I had to repair. Like, Cause Janeway's always around here fucking around, doing her weird shit. Captain Braxton's like, fuck that nonsense. So 27th century, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a little mark here. You kind of got like the 20, I'm gonna just say the like, 27th century here, you got Captain Braxton, you got the time cops. Because apparently, like America, the Federation decides that it's their jurisdiction to go anywhere in time and space and just impose their will on everybody. But again, you know, Janeway does need to be stopped, so. I guess time cops. Star Trek! Oh, Captain. Braxton was right about one thing. Voyager shows up on our sensors far too often. Try to avoid time travel. Okay, so we will get back to the timeline over here in just a minute, but let's go back to the 24th century here because it's time to talk about the stuff that happens after Star Trek Voyager, and that's mostly the Next Generation movies. Now, not a ton happens in some of the Star Trek Next Generation movies. The first one we got is Star Trek Generations. Um, all that really happens in that is that Kirk, uh, turns out Captain Kirk, uh, died. Uh, supposedly right about here in the timeline, but he didn't actually die. Turns out he went into uh, this thing called the Nexus where like all your dreams come true. It's like Disneyland, but like Star Trek. But Christmas still happens there because Christianity is, uh, there, it's always Christmas in the Nexus. So uh, they, they, Kirk gets sent here, but then Picard gets sent in there and he like takes Kirk back and uh, they, they kill Malcolm McDowell. Um, so that's Star Trek Generations. Uh, Captain Kirk leaves Christmas and kills Malcolm McDowell. Quite aptly, the best uh, line in all of Star Trek is said in Generations, time is the fire in which we burn. They say time is the fire in which we burn. Which given Janeway, I mean, that could be Janeway's motto. Time is the fire in which we burn. Actually, no, Janeway's motto would be like, uh, time is the fire that I start and burn everyone in hell with me in. Anyways, next up, Star Trek First Contact. Now, this is probably the only Star Trek uh, Next Generation movie worth talking about. This is when uh, we learn that uh, the Borg try to attack again. They, they try to attack the Federation again because they're all, like, super cute about it. And they go back in time all the way back here to the 21st century. Uh, sorry, right, right before. In fact, let me move the whales here. So they go back here, and uh, we, we the whales get saved right about here. So that right after the eugenics wars that totally happened. So they get sent back in time, and it turns out that there was a third world war. So we got World War Three going on down here, which technically in the Star Trek timeline is about to happen in about like 10 years or so. According to Star Trek, in, in the next 10 years ago, so we're going to lose all the whales. Uh, the eugenics wars apparently are happening in World War Three. Looking forward to all of that. Anywho, after World War III happened, uh, this is when a guy named Zephyrin Cochran uh, made the warp engine, which is like all how all the ships in all of Star Trek work. So it's like very, very important, and that's when we meet the Vulcans. So the Borg go back in time and try to stop that from happening, and Picard's like, nah, nah, nah. And he goes back too, and he has like a whole Moby Dick thing against the Borg, gets very pissed off. And I will make them pay for what they've done. Ooh, 
my love I can feel you in my bones But the most important thing to remember uh, about the first contact is we meet the actual leader of the Borg. And the leader of the Borg is this lady named the Borg Queen. We too are on a quest to better ourselves, evolving toward a state of perfection. Forgive me, but the Borg do not evolve. They conquer. By assimilating other beings into our collective. I'll put her up here. Now, as you can see, the Borg Queen uh, might be the hottest thing in all of Star Trek and also the scariest thing in all of Star Trek. Like, there were a lot of teenage boys and like bisexual and lesbian women and non-binary folks who were into women who saw the Borg Queen and like had a sexual awakening and also became terrified of sex at the same time. <gasps> That good for you. Ooh. All about sex, but you don't want anything to do with sex. Because she's like 20%, like only the top half of her body exists. So that's the Borg Queen. She fucks data. I am fully functional. Programmed in multiple techniques. How long has it been since you've used them? Eight years, seven months, 16 days, four minutes, 22. Far too long. Sorry, what were we talking about? Next up, we have Star Trek Insurrection. And that's all I have to say about Star Trek Insurrection. He never should bow down to a domineering frown. Or the, or the tang, tang of a tyrant tongue. tongue. But then, we have Star Trek Nemesis. Ladies and gentlemen, and invited transgendered species. Oh boy, all right. We're gonna talk about Star Trek Nemesis. So in Star Trek Nemesis, a generation's final journey, as it were, this is the last Next Generation movie, uh, the end of like the Enterprise and, and Picard off doing stuff and things like that. Data dies in this movie, and it's kind of fucked up. The other thing too, is we learn that the Romulans way, 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 way back, made a clone of Picard, and apparently Picard, when he's younger, looks like Tom Hardy, uh, and also is apparently still bald. So I don't know when, when Patrick Stewart was losing his, was losing his hair, but anyways, young Patrick Stewart apparently looks like Tom Hardy, because uh, that, that's a clone, and Shinzon, uh, we'll be honest, Shinzon kind of, we'll put him, we'll put him down here because Shinzon doesn't deserve to be at the top. Uh, Shinzon kind of sucks. He basically leads a coup against the Romulan Empire and like kills the entire Romulan government, which is not as destabilizing as you would think, but he does it anyways. But here's the thing. Remember earlier when I teased the most important alien all of Star Trek? Well, here's where we're gonna get to that. Because what we learn with Shinzon is that not only that there were the Vulcans and the Romulans, when Shinzon takes over the government of Romulus, he doesn't do it alone. He does it with another alien species, which we learn are actually an offshoot of the Romulans. Yes, there's the Vulcans, there's Romulans, and then there is the Remans. Remans. Oh, they're the worst. The most important alien in all of Star Trek is the goddamn Remans. This was a mistake. We're wasting time. Remans. Yeah, get it? Like you have Romulans, Remans. I don't know what Vulcans are doing, but Romulan, Remans, Romulus, Remans, the whole thing kind of fitting with the Roman thing. But Remans, look at these little devil monster things. Look at them, look at them. Look at them, look at them. got little eyebrows, these little angry eyebrows. These dudes are insanely important, all right? Look, you have Vulcans, clearly one of the most important aliens in all of Star Trek. You have the Romulans, one of the biggest, like, one of the biggest like geopolitical things in Star Trek, they are super important. And so what we learn in Nemesis is that the Romulans actually sent a bunch of their people off to the moon of Romulus, a lot of moon stuff with these civilizations, and these people evolved into Remans. You see, Remans are actually an offshoot of Romulans who are an offshoot of the Vulcans. So these guys are little demon Vulcans. 
Little Demon Vulcans. And what they are is a slave race that revolts against their masters, doing an uprising. It's like a, a very empowering story of people persevering against struggle. Not only that, they're related to the most important aliens in all of Star Trek. They they team up with Tom Hardy, which again, Shinzon sucks, but Tom Hardy's great. And so they, they at least get the attraction choice. Also, look at them. Look at, the, look at how scary they look. And yet they have the little pointed ears. Raymonds! Like, they embody everything that Star Trek is about. People who have been, you know, slaves for forever, fighting back for their rights to gain a sense of, of dignity and composure. They are, I, I, I just, I cannot tell you how much I love the Raymonds. And Spock, by the way, his whole thing is like, I want to reunite the Romulans and the Vulcans. Remember I was saying that's super important and be a big, huge deal? Well, the Raymonds have every right to be reunified with the Vulcans as well. They are just as important as the goddamn Romulans and Vulcans. Raymonds. Most important goddamn aliens in Star Trek, in my opinion. Uh, I'm sure, as we continue in the timeline, they're going to play a huge role going forward. But we'll get to that in just a minute. All right, now that we've talked about the importance of the Remans and how crucial a role they're most certainly going to play in the Star Trek timeline in the future, we'll get back to them in just a second. Because while there's still more stuff that happens past this point, we're going to actually go back a little bit. Because now, at this point in Star Trek, we got a little show that we like to call... Star Trek Enterprise. Yes, you see, Star Trek Enterprise is a show that takes place during the 22nd century. It takes place before the Earth-Romulan War, but after World War III and after humanity starts reaching out to the stars. We become friends with the Vulcans, we're kind of buddy-buddy with them. Vulcans are a little bit douchey at this point in the timeline. Vulcan EV suits or something else, like you're flying around inside your own little starship. <laughs> you're easily impressed. Something wrong with your puck tar? No. If it's not to your liking, I'm sure our chef can prepare you something else. I've already eaten. Hope you saved room for dessert. Humanity's like, we want to go out, we want to meet new people, we're, we're kind of evolving, we're still little kind of assholes, but less of assholes. Um, Scott Bakula is on the ship and he's like, I'm just going to go out and, and do shit. Um, so that's Star Trek Enterprise. It's a weird show, very too early 2000s. Like the most important thing you need to realize about Star Trek Enterprise is there's like a lot of gelling people up in the like decom chamber. Like a lot of gel gets used in Star Trek Enterprise. It's time to let it go. Nice to be clean again. It is pleasant. It's time to let it go. Let it go so and low. Apparently, uh, humans at this point in our evolution, um, really all about the gel. Which, you know, knowing Gene Roddenberry's vision for a sex future, I, I, I think lubrication was very important to, to aliens and humanity at that point. Thing that you're going to have to realize with Star Trek Enterprise is is that one of the people that Captain Archer, that's Scott Bakula's character, meets as he's sort of going out and exploring the galaxy and starting to make allies before the Federation, is he meets this guy named Crewman Daniels, who is one of the coolest dudes in all of Star Trek. You see, Crewman Daniels is actually from the future. Remember these time cop people that I was talking about before? Well, after the time cops, there's like kind of an even more time copy people because there's this thing called the Temporal Cold War. In fact, we're going to jump over here. You see, way past here in the 27th century, we have this thing called the Temporal Cold War. Now, in the Temporal Cold War, there's like a bunch of different uh, groups and things that are kind of going back in time throughout all of this and kind of fucking with it. They're kind of like Janeway, but like not trying to be too obvious about it where Jamie was just like ah fuck it these people are just like we're gonna we're gonna like maybe we'll pop in here and change a little thing maybe we'll make 
Doc Brown a little bit different, or maybe we'll like uh, do something with with Spock here, or like uh, well, maybe we'll take away Spock's beard or whatever. They they kind of like they're just people bouncing around all over here. Just sort of going around. And Crewman Daniels is one dude who keeps coming back to this time period and is BFFs with Archer because someone is sending a lot of shit back in time to try and fuck with Archer. Because what you see, what we learn, is that Archer, after the Romulan Earth War happens, which happens, you know, off screen because Enterprise got canceled a little bit too early, but was building up to the Earth Romulan War, it would have been really, really cool. But we didn't get to see it. But what we learn is that Archer eventually helps form the Federation the Federation and all this stuff happens and he becomes the first president of the Federation because who wouldn't vote for Scott Bakula? I mean, he gets to join some of the elite members of the Federation presidents like uh, Red. It's, like, it's Scott Bakula and Red. Those are your Federation presidents, folks. I'm here for it. Honestly, I feel like that, that, that's the kind of world that I really want to live in. You have no idea how much I'm restraining myself from knocking you on your ass. X is going to equal me kicking your ass. So we, uh, we have up here, we have the Temporal Cold War, which I'm going to kind of um, illustrate on the timeline by doing this. Just, it's like the Fraser loop, but on steroids. Like, so much shit going on here. Now, one of the big factions of the Temporal Cold War, besides there's like Space Nazis and also a guy named Future Guy, but regardless of that, there is a group of people that are part of the Temporal Cold War called the Sphere Builders. Now, what the Sphere Builders are, are an alien race that tried to, like, have a war with the Federation way up here in the 27th century. We're going to signify that with the Enterprise J, which is the dumbest ship ever made. Like, look at its little cells. They're like little toothpicks. Also, this thing is technically, like, 30 miles long. Like, 20 USS Discoveries could fit inside this thing. So that's the size of the ships that we're dealing with at this point in the time period. But way up here... They start a war with the Federation and their giant, weird, stupid ships. And so they, they're losing that. So that's the, let's just call this the Sphere Builder, Builder War. So they are like, nah, we don't want to deal with these stupid ships. So they send stuff back in time and they tell this group of people called the Zindi, who I'll talk about in just a second on the other side of the board, and they tell them humanity is actually going to kill them. Which is a lie, because the Zindis are actually going to join the Federation at some point. But because they believe this, they create like a weapon of mass destruction. Totally not a reference to anything. Um, they make a weapon of mass destruction to go and attack the humanity, build a sphere, and they destroy Florida. Like, Florida? Like, fuck, fuck, like, Florida is just gone. Like, it's, Florida does not exist in Star Trek. Which may explain how things got better for humanity after that point. But Florida's, Florida's gone. Uh, and so Archer goes and he befriends the Zindi. He's like, no, 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 no. We're going to be best buddies. The Spear Builders are lying to you. The, uh, the Zindi War in here. And what I'm realizing, looking at this timeline, is there's a lot of wars that happen in Star Trek. I mean, we have the Eugenics War, World War III, Earth Romulan War, Zindi War, the, the fucked up Florida War. Uh, we've got the, the uh, uh, Borg War, the Dominion War, the Klingon War happens, the Temporal War just a lot of wars. You know, we talk about Star Trek, oh, there's no wars in Star Trek Future. There's, there's a fuck ton of wars in Star Trek. Anywho, so that's, that's Star Trek Enterprise. They, they become friends with the Zindi, and uh, Archer becomes the first president of the Federation after the Earth Romulan War, and then uh, the Federation happens, and we get uh, all this, this fun stuff. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. within us, woven into the threads that bind us, all of us, to each other. But the most important thing to remember is the temporal Cold War. That's going to be a big deal in just a second. Now, we're going to return to the 24th century in just a moment, but I want to make one last reference and one last return to the evil bisexual blue eyeshadow universe, um, because we also uh, visit that universe in Star Trek Enterprise way here in the 22nd century. And we learned that the Terran Empire has formed. They're, they're kind of a big deal. They're starting to go and kill a bunch of people because this is the fascism blue eyeshadow universe, apparently. Uh, so that's that's going on. But an important thing that happens during this period is, do you remember I mentioned way back here in the 23rd century, there was that ship, the Defiant, that disappeared in the 23rd century. It was just sort of hanging about, mucking about, and all this nonsense over here. Well, when it disappeared, what we learn is it actually traveled from our universe back in time, 100 years, but to the other, the bisexual universe. 
And in the bisexual universe, this ship gets sent there. And Archer, the evil Archer, the bisexual Archer, finds this ship, which has technology from 100 years in the future, and they use it. Hoshi Sato, who is one of his crew members, kills Archer and steals the ship and uses it to consolidate power of the Terran Empire. Um, uh, and then some weird stuff happens, and eventually George O becomes the empress of, uh, of the bisexual universe. You deserve a treat. So, uh, for some reason, even though they had 100 year more advanced technology 100 years beforehand, by the time that we reach the 23rd century of the bisexual universe, everything's just kind of the same. Like, they don't use the technology really at all, apparently. Which I guess kind of makes sense, because they all kind of hoard it and don't really share it with anybody, and no one really like likes scientific advancement. So I guess that kind of makes sense to a degree. That's the that's basically the timeline of the Blue Eyeshadow universe. It's, uh, they get cool technology, get Hitler, who becomes BFF, Spock's like, uh, maybe fascism, but actually, Terran Empire goes away, uh, humanity gets enslaved uh, by other evil bisexuals, the Cardassian and Klingons uh, sort of take over. And eventually, the Deep Space Nine crew kind of save the Terran Empire and things get better. So we don't really know what happens after that. Like, maybe it's fine. Maybe it's not. My guess is there's more bisexuals and there's more uh, fascism uh, over there. So that's, uh, that's the story of the evil bisexual universe. This brings us to the 22nd century aliens. So we're going all the way back. These are the aliens that matter during this period. And really, there's a few that go on. There's like the Sulaban and everything. But really, the, there's only two you kind of need to know. The first one is uh, the Zindi. The Zindi are a bunch of aliens from one planet. So like a bunch of different distinct groups. But they all come together in direct hatred of humanity. Because apparently, humanity like supplied them weapons and did terrible things to them in the future. At least that's what they were told. And so they were lied to. And basically, they tried to destroy humanity because of time travel stuff. It gets weird. Just know that they're basically a 9-11 metaphor, um, but, like, not great. I mean, like, the Zindi, the whole Zindi arc is cool, but, like, it's trying to do, like, 9-11, but Star Trek, but also caught up in the jingoism of the, like, early 2000s, post-9-11 stuff. So it was, like... The airlock's decompressing, sir. <gasps> He'll die. Not for another 20 seconds, he won't. Oh. Zindi. And the Enterprise did its... It tried. It tried. It did its best. One of the Zindis played by the dude who became Negan, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, over on The, uh, the Walking Dead, so... That's cool. Zindi. Also, one other alien that you need to know is the Andorians. They're, like, blue-skinned people with, like, little antenna on their head. I actually love the Andorians. They have four genders. They're one of the founding members of the Federation. Like, founding members of the Federation are humans. Vulcans, Andorians, and the Tellarites, but no one gives a crap about the Tellarites. They're basically sentient pigs. I say that quite literally. I'm told this ship is the pride of Starfleet. I find it small and unimpressive. Funny. I was about to say the same thing about you. <laughs> um, so... Fuck Tellarites, but Andorians, they're very cool. Also played by Jeffrey Coombs a lot of the time, so. Just imagine like all the Andorians are Jeffrey Coombs and you pretty much got the idea. All right, so we're gonna return back to the 24th century because after the Star Trek Nemesis stuff, the next show that happens is Star Trek Lower Decks, the animated show. Now, I love this show. Star Trek Lower Decks is my favorite Star Trek show of all time, but uh, kind of the whole point of the show is that nothing important happens in it. First contact is a delicate, high-stakes operation of diplomacy. One must be ready for anything when humanity is interacting with an alien race for the first time. But we don't do that. Our specialty is second contact. Still pretty important. We get all the paperwork signed, make sure we're spelling the name of the planet right, get to know all the good places to eat. <gasps> the only important thing that you need to know that happens in Star Trek Lower Decks is that we see at one point in the series, in one of the episodes, a giant skeleton, a giant 600 foot tall skeleton, wearing a blue Starfleet uniform. And so what that tells us is that some point between here and here, our 600 foot Spock 2 friend, he kicks it. So he's, he's dead. The salvation of a galaxy, Spock 2. <laughs> Somewhere between here and here, he dies, and his 
the skeleton gets displayed in the museum for all to see. Which isn't dark and morbid at all, considering that Spock is one of the mascots of Star Trek, um, and everyone loves him, and even though it was a 600 foot tall clone version of him, we still love him just as much as regular Spock. Spock A, if you will. My thoughts exactly, Mr. Spock. So one might assume, Mr. Spock. So, just saying, Lower Decks, Mike McMahon, it's kind of fucked up. Eh, it's funny. It was funny. Come on, it was a little bit funny. <laughs> fuck, fuck that Spock. Anyways, another show that happens at this same time, like kind of right after Star Trek Lower Decks, is we get Star Trek Prodigy. There is a non-binary blob, is one of the characters in Star Trek Prodigy. Um, and I don't think I'm gonna identify more of the character ever in my life than a non-binary blob. It's time I show you who I truly am, so you cannot hurt anyone else! So, excited about that. Now, I won't spoil too much because Star Trek Prodigy is a still ongoing series at this point, and it's a really serialized show, so to say too much about it would be to ruin it for you. But I will say it's a great show, and it all revolves around Janeway fucking around with time travel this time, except now she's involved kids! Yes. Why is her forehead so smooth? Ugh. You're no summer peach either, Tellerite. Ha 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 ha! Pog likes her! Damn it, Janeway, the time cops thought they were done with you and you just, just, just keep coming back in! But at the very least, Janeway and Chakotay shippers are living wild after nearly 20 years of nothing. If I run into any trouble, you'll be the first one I call. Freeze program. <laughs> Why didn't you call? I mean, for literal years, Janeway Chakotay shippers had just that one episode where Janeway also spends as much time with a monkey as she does with Chakotay. So they're just, they're just feasting right now. If you're suggesting I should get out of here, I agree. Now, there are a few more major events that happen in the 24th century. The next biggest one is apparently, at this point in the universe, a supernova occurs in the Romulan Empire, and it blows up the entire Romulan Empire. So basically here, at this point in the timeline, Romulans get fucked. Now, while the Romulan Empire gets completely decimated, one good thing that happens is that Picard, our intrepid Picard here, he leads a team of people that go and rescue as many uh, Romulans as possible, getting them out of their territory, saving as many of them as is, uh, as is possible. It's like a whole rescue effort. It's the thing that the Federation does. They do a really good job with it. Until uh, synthetic people like Data, who have been built to help with this effort, like they attack a shipyard that was making ships for the Romulans and uh, instead of being good people, the Federation's like, nah, fuck the Romulans. We're done with them. Half of them never wanted to rescue the Romulans in the first place. And the rest are, are just frightened. I never dreamed that Starfleet would give in to intolerance and fear. Admiral Picard, with all due respect, and at long last, shut the fuck up. And uh, instead of saving any more Romulans, uh, Picard retires and the Romulan Empire gets blown up. But it's okay. A lot of Romulans get saved at that point. They get rescued and everyone's, you know, at least they're still around. And everyone's fine for the most part. Except for the Remans. You see, there's this show called Star Trek Picard, which takes place a little while after this Romulans get fucked storyline. Uh, and we see like the Romulans are okay, they're all fine and everything, but we don't see any Remans. Do you wanna know why? Because of, in Romulan Empire, like everyone's trying to evacuate Romulus and evacuate the Romulan Star Empire before it gets completely obliterated. Do you think the slave race is gonna get top priority seating there? I don't think so. So what this tells me is that when this star exploded, the most important aliens in all of Star Trek got blown up too. I'm just saying, no one gave a fuck about the Remans, and I'm gonna die mad about it.
Apparently no, only it's a goddamn climate. Fuck about the goddamn Remans. Anyways, now that we've decided that we all don't give a flying fuck about the Remans, talking about Star Trek Picard, Star Trek Picard is weird. We, like, there's a lot of stuff, like, the Romulans are kind of all cast up from society, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the synths who uh, got sort of ostracized by Federation society and literally outlawed and start to come back and we realize there's, like, a whole race of synthetic people that exist. It's a, it's a very confusing plot, but based long and short of it is, like, Picard does a speech and the synths are back in the Federation. Show them how profoundly wrong they are about you. You're not the enemy. You're not the destroyer. If that doesn't convince them, then they will have to answer to the Federation. The same Federation that banned us and threw us on the scrap heap. One hour later. And now that they've lifted the ban on synthetics, I'm free to travel. Yeah, it's all cool. Even though the Romans are all dead and no one gave a fuck about the Remans, they're all gone. But yeah, it's all cool. Synths are great. Um, also, we also learned that uh, outside of the galaxy, there are these eldritch horror uh, monster synthetic people that are hell-bent on destroying all living life in the galaxy. Um, that's a thing that's in Star Trek Picard. Just robot eldritch horror demons. Kind of like, think the Reapers from Mass Effect, but tentacly. That's in Star Trek Picard, so that's a thing. It's a thing that happens. It's definitely in there. So, that's cool. Also, Seven of Nines in Star Trek Picard. She's kick-ass, because Seven of Nine, she's the best thing. So Star Trek Picard, kind of a mixed bag. Kind of a mixed bag. So one other thing that I need to talk about with the Romulans getting fucked thing. Now, when 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 the supernova was going off to destroy the Romulans, technically that supernova was so big, apparently. Don't don't ask about the science of this, but apparently the supernova was so big that it was going to destroy the Federation as well. Now, uh, because of that, Spock, you know, our good Spock, who was hanging out over on Romulus there, still trying to be like, I'm going to unify everybody. He's like, I'm not going to let that happen. So what he does is he finds this shit called red matter. I, I don't have a picture of it, so we're just gonna like, it's just a big, we'll just say red matter here. And what he does is he uses the red matter to stop the explosion from happening. Not in time to save the Romulans. The Romulans are still fucked. But um, he stops the explosion from happening. But at the same time, this dude named Nero here. Hi, Christopher, I'm Nero. Uh, he is very pissy. It has happened! I watched it happen! I saw it happen! Don't tell me it didn't happen! And what he does is he uh, attacks Spock right at this moment, and they both get somehow sent into the supernova, and they get sent back in time. But instead of getting sent back in time to earlier in the timeline, they technically get sent from here to a completely other universe. Now, to represent this, I need to erase the bisexual blue eyeshadow universe, so we're just going to get rid of that. This is what I call bi erasure, folks. This is this is quite literally bi erasure going on here. All right. Anyways, Spock gets sent back in time to the 23rd century right here and creates an entire new universe from this moment forward. You see, everything before this point in this universe Exactly the same. Everything happens exactly the same in this universe as, as it does here. But from right here, right, this is right where Kirk gets born. Spock gets sent back right to the moment of Kirk's birth because they're soulmates and, and Kirk and Spock are meant to be together. So of course Spock gets sent back to the exact moment where Kirk is born. But because he gets sent back in time, events change and different stuff happens in this universe going forward. Star Trek fans call this verse the Chris Pinoverse. That's the uh, technical name for this universe, the Chris Pineverse. Uh, and these are the movies that happened from Star Trek uh, 2009 onwards. Um, and the, that, that's this timeline here. All the ones with Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, um, and all the sexier faces that aren't William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy. So we got our little little pissy dude, little Nero here. He's all, he's all upset and yelly. Fire everything! Kirk's father gets killed in, in the moment that Nero comes back in time, because Nero's all pissy, um, and it creates the events of Star Trek 2009. Now, this is basically, just imagine like the same thing sort of happened here, like Kirk joins Starfleet, everyone's sort of like, yeah, but Kirk's a little bit more of a douche in this universe. Straight up. I'll make that two her shots on it. Her shot's on her. Thanks, but no thanks. Don't you at least want to know my name before you completely reject me? I'm fine without it. You are fine without it. It's Jim, Jim Kirk. Though not as much of a douche as William Shatner in real life, but a little bit of a douche. But the most important thing that happens in this movie to create this sort of new timeline, this different things, is that Nero, because he's all pissed off that the Remans got fucked up and the Romulans got all fucked up, 
he goes and destroys the planet Vulcan in the 23rd century. So Vulcans, in this timeline, Vulcans fucked. So in one timeline, the Romulans and Remans are fucked. In the other timeline, the Vulcans get fucked. So no matter what you do, someone's getting fucked. Uh, either it's logically or emotionally, but someone's getting fucked. Now, eventually Captain Kirk and crew stop Nero. They kill him and everything, and so it's all fine. Uh, but then the next thing that happens in this universe is Star Trek Into Darkness. And we really don't need to talk all that much about Star Trek Into Darkness. Not a lot happens in it. The only thing with this is apparently, because of Star Trek Into Darkness, Khan comes back, but is apparently a white dude now. Is Khan. I don't know, I don't know how, uh, how this suddenly caused Khan to become white, but Khan's white in this universe. Star Trek! Now, I want to take a moment because I was editing this video and I got to that moment where I made the joke about Khan becoming a white guy in Star Trek Into Darkness. And as I was editing it, I realized what the response to that joke was going to be in the comments on YouTube. And I know that the comments are going to be, well, actually, Jesse, if you had read the Star Trek Khan prequel comic written by Mike Johnson and Robert Orsi, it is clearly explained why Khan no longer looks like Ricardo Montalban because Admiral Marcus kidnapped, kidnapped him and wiped his memory and gave him plastic surgery to look like Benedict Cumbersnatch so that he wouldn't realize that he was actually Khan and then he gets his memory back later on and that's why he realizes that he's Khan by, by the time, time of Star Trek Into Darkness. And he's able to have that scene where he says, my name is Khan. My name is Khan. And I sat there in the editing bay realizing that this would be the comment and I just wanted to say, y'all think I don't know about Star Trek Khan written by Mike Johnson and Roberto Orsi? Do you see these comics behind me? That's not even all of them. I have more down here. This is a whole row of just Star Trek comics. I know my Star Trek comics. Don't you come at me with the, oh, have you read the comics by Mike Johnson and Robert Orsi? I know my comics by Mike Johnson and Robert Orsi. Look, I even got it. It's right, it's right. Get out of the stupid... I can't get out of the stupid show. Okay, there, there. right there. You see it? That's Benedict Cumberbatch's face. There's one there, and then there's a... He's, he's down there running. Look at him run. Look at that. Look, there it is. There, There's the comic explaining him going from, from being an Indian dude to a white dude. Yeah. That's in a Star Trek comic. Isn't that exciting? Also, did you know there's some 1960s comics that have, like, the engines of the Enterprise be, like, rocket engines? Yeah, look at that shit. Also, there's some of these old freaking comics where they have Uhura be a white girl named Uhuru, which is which is a thing that happened, which is kind of fun uh, in a weird way. Uh, yeah, fun may be the wrong word there. Oh, but also there's some comics where, like, they find a haunted house floating in space. Like, Star Trek comics get weird. They get really weird. It's awesome. I know my Star Trek shit. Y'all are just boys up here being like, Haha, <laughs> yes, my boy. Have you read the Star Trek Khan prequel comic by Mike Johnson and Roberto Orsi where they clearly explain why Khan no longer looks like Ricardo Montalban? <laughs> why, yes, of course I've read the Star Trek Khan prequel comic by Mike Johnson and Roberto Orsi. <laughs> Reminds me of that time in Star Trek The Next Generation where Captain Picard decided that he wanted to yell at Wesley for being a fucking asshole. Yes, indeed, King. Kids are assholes. Oh, such plebeian Star Trek fans. By the way, have you had enough Chateau Picard, year 2369? Oh no, I have quite enough right here. <laughs> and I'm just here being the transgender freako, being like, give me more of the salamander babies from Star Trek Voyager. Where are the salamander babies? Can't wait. Where are the salamander babies? We don't know what happened to them. They just disappear after that episode. This is the canon that transgender freakos like me need to know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's what I think about while I edit these videos. So anytime you're watching a video of mine, just know this is who I am. Run, Con, run! Yeah. So, don't come at me. I think I actually broke this book doing that.
And then after that, we get uh, the next movie, which is personally my favorite movie in this timeline, Star Trek Beyond. Love Star Trek Beyond. Really great movie. But the only thing that really happens in that is Idris Elba is sexy as all hell. I break bread with the enemy. Um, which is great because Idris Elba is the best thing. But also uh, the Enterprise of this universe gets uh, gets blown up. So there's that. Oh, I forgot to mention the Enterprise in this universe. Uh, the Kirk's Enterprise gets blown up. In this one, the one where, where Kirk's son dies, the Enterprise gets blown up there. So, that happens. But it happens here, which is like way early. Like technically this is like here in the timeline up there. So like imagine that's like, like there. So, um, I hope this you know, making this timeline as comprehensible as I humanly possibly can, I think I'm doing a fairly good job for all of you. I don't know who the hell is gonna watch. Uh, if you're watching this video still, uh, Happens Help You, this is just basically one long shit post to all two people that are still watching this video at this point. I love you. You are the best people. All right, so that is the Chris Pinoverse. Uh, we might get more stuff after this point. Who knows, Paramount and, and whatever needs to get their shit together, but at some point, We'll get more there, maybe. Who knows? I swear to God, we are almost at the end here, but there's a couple more things that we need to discuss. Because you see, I left this whole section down here at the end wide open. And I bet you're wondering why. I mean, there's a fuck ton of stuff here. The temporal cold war even happens. And it's just sort of crazy. So what we're gonna have to do actually at this point in the story is go all the way back to our friends here in Star Trek Discovery. Remember our little little spore mushroom ship that's uh, dancing on a rain cloud of mushrooms? Well, these people, uh, they like to also, like Janeway, they like to fuck with time as well. Because what we learn in this timeline, at least at this point in, in, in Discovery, is that there is apparently an AI that the Federation created that wants to destroy all human life in the galaxy. Just like Picard, there's another alien thing that wants to kill all life in the galaxy because apparently in modern Star Trek, there's just a lot of people that just want to destroy everything. I love modern Star Trek, but there's a lot of like universe ending shit that like, calm yourself. Not everything needs to end the universe, writers. Not everything needs to end the universe every single moment. That's why I like Lower Decks quite a bit. Uh, so, logically, to order to stop this AI, from destroying all life in the galaxy, they decide that they need to build a time travel angel suit to travel in time. Time travel angel suit. So to get it away from the AI, instead of stopping the AI, which they actually do do in the season, they actually stop the AI, which means that kind of what their whole thing that they plan is kind of a moot point. But regardless, in order to stop the AI from destroying the galaxy, they take their spore mushroom ship and they time travel all the way over here past this tangled nonsense mess that is the temporal cold war to the, what, what, technically it's the 31st century at the end of the board, but I only have so much whiteboard left. So we're going to take the ship and it's just going to go right there. And this is still Star Trek Discovery, but it's Star Trek Discovery Reboot Edition. And it got significant, I mean, I like Star Trek Discovery Seasons 1 and 2. I, I will fight for them, but it got so much better when they, like, said all of this. Now, what we learn here, at this point in the Star Trek timeline, is that apparently at some point the Temporal Cold War became the Temporal Hot War, if you know what I mean. And, and things got really fucking weird. And then the Temporal Wars happened. And Everyone was killing everyone else and trying to use me to do it. <sighs> it wasn't pretty. And it was, a, it was a whole temporal war. Uh, people were fighting dogs and cats living together. Pandemonium. It was insane. The Sphere Builder War happened there at some point. Future Guy was doing shit. But anyways, we survived this tangled nonsense and the time cops and all that jazz. But eventually, the Federation still existed. I am curious as to what remains of the rest of the Federation. 38 member worlds that we're aware of, down from 350 at its peak. But for some reason, surprisingly, all dilithium, which is the stuff that you need to make warp happen, all blew up at the same moment in an event called the burn. Yeah, every single ship blew up 
uh, at the same exact moment across the Federation and across the entire galaxy, meaning that no one could uh, get to anybody and get together uh, for parties and uh, to talk about how hot the Borg Queen was. No one could do that anymore. It was, it was very, very sad. And so Discovery gets to this point in the timeline and they're like, that sucks. The burn is a thing that happens. I won't spoil how the burn happens. Uh, let's just say when I talked about on the other side, the Kelpians being maybe gods, maybe they're gods. Just connect that with the burn. It's a whole thing. Um, we learned that the Federation still exists in this time period, and they got really fucking cool ships, much better than the stupid Enterprise J. Fascinating. The distortion field seems to be sustained by the collective energy of every ship within it. Detecting neutronium alloy fibers, this, this used to be theoretical. Some of these hulls are organic. <laughs> some, some are completely comprised of holographic containment walls. Is that a new constitution? I bet it can sleep a crew of a thousand. No. 2000 like for some reason they went from like good ships good ships good ships good ships just dumb as all hell ships and then back to cool ships again like really cool ships like broken off the cells all this sort of stuff but uh the federation uh new federation we'll just call this the new federation uh happens here and the discovery joins the new federation uh and they set off to try and rebuild everything after the burn because Discovery on its magical mushroom superhighway ship can actually traverse the Federation because they don't need no damn dilithium to, tr to travel. They just need to get high on mushrooms uh, and they can bring the Federation back together. And that is where Star Trek Discovery ends. And I think that uh, that brings us to the end of our Star Trek timeline. This is it. The only thing I forgot to mention is Star Trek Short Treks. So this is like another Star Trek show, but it kind of bounces around. It's all like an anthology show. So we'll just like... We'll just stick it right here with the Fraser loop. Okay, and there is one final thing that happens at this part of the timeline that we need to talk about just a little bit. Because turns out, in this far future of the Federation, after the burn, the Federation breaks up. But one thing that happens during the burn is because that the Federation has been completely decimated and blown apart, two groups Two disparate groups who used to be one finally came together, fulfilling one legendary Vulcan's dream. Yes, Spock's dream of unification of the Romulans and Vulcans actually happens by the 31st century. Yeah. The Vulcans and the Romulans were two tribes of the same species that went their separate ways. Your brothers started the process of reunifying them. And he succeeded. It took centuries after his death, but yes. Vulcans and Romulans, together, coming together. It's harmony, it's Star Trek, right? People coming together despite their differences and forming something greater than the whole. It's wonderful and beautiful, right? Well, you know who gets forgotten during this? The motherfucking Remans, cause they are dead. Remans. Oh, they're the worst. The Remans are dead, and the Vulcans and Romulans are just don't give a goddamn fuck. They're just like, oh yeah, we're back together, Spock's wonderful, we did it! And then they're just like sitting all high and pretty, and the Remans are gone! Not a single mention of the goddamn beautiful Remans! They were just trying their best! They were just... You know what? No. This is unacceptable. No, screw them. Screw... Screw the damn Vulcans. Screw the damn Romulans. I'm just done. I'm out. I'm out. interwebs <laughs> i hope that this was enjoy i don't know what this video was like i said i'm sure all of like three people have made it to this point in the video and, and if you are one of those three people um thank you i hope this was fun and funny clearly this was not meant to be for anybody except for myself <laughs> i'm doing this for you i'm doing this for you
but hopefully someone enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for whatever more of whatever this is. I swear I'm more comprehensible in other videos. I also have a Patreon page that helps support me doing whatever this is, uh, but I really appreciate you hanging out with me and having fun with me, and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Hey, hey you, yeah, yeah you, you cutie patootie nerds. <laughs> Cutie patootie. I'm a goddamn 1920s grandma. Anyways, thank you all you wonderful nerds who are my patrons, who allow me to do this, who allow me to do what I do. I could not do this uh, YouTube channel. I could not pay my bills. I could not support my baby Newt, my kitty Newt, without all of you. So thank you so much for all of that. And an extra special thank you to Catherine Lambeth, Carrie Ellen Foss, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Lily Gray, Ogisha Wise, Mary Mello, Heather Long, El Tan Tivy, Barbie Ann Rounds, Jack McCallan, Stephen Kleinard, Quattro, Michael Wolnes, Courtney Ray Kelly, Jem Shin, Ali Gobert, Alex Miller, Barbara Ruski, Randy Thompson, Matt Chung, Christian Hurst, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Alan Altman, Super Desi, Wellington Marcus, Christine S, Britz Creek, Zach Cody, Screaming Vixen, Lily Bailey. Jessica Kimbrell, Boyd Earl, Vincent Ellington, Meadow Whisper, Felicia Tost, Chloe Dollar, Joseph Dewey, Marshall Nye, James Krivda, Gordon Alexander, Rose Connolly, Jane Slusser, Dominic Noble, Laura Runner, Zone One Librarian, Jennifer Fuss, Weirdly Beardly, Chris Bodley Dinch, Sunk Corgi, Sean McKenzie, Sonia Nero Perdo, Nathaniel Fronten, Hellscape Wanderer, Jolene Cassidy, Far Rangato. Ooh, they kind of rhymed. Transit Toronto. Painy Coke, Rain Corkin, Wendis Abizzel, Ryan Hunter, Spencer Brownlee, John Weatherby, Damian Rice, W. Randy Eadie, Sage Corbett, Tang Wilson, Wayne L., Belinda Walters, Nisa Marie. Hopefully I said that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Kilara Arell, Stephen Richardson, Zach Prax, Carry On, Drew Bach, Beatrix Purvis, Cyber Quaker, Jade Perissus, Kevin Frotek, Autumn Jenny, Maddie H., Matthew Correglo, Sean Piper, Sean Sullivan, Lysa Flynn. Epsilon is greater than the Mighty Ginger Joe Duh. Devin Camerlocker, Flying Cated Dragon, Melody Ann Winters Good, Mark H. Williams Author, Sally Leslie Hutchkins, Sarah Bystem, Casual Observer, Gretchen Badger, William Stewart, Marion Herb, Jordan Long, Katie K., Patricia Crompton, Michael and Kate Hawk. Blueberry Hill, Verdict Sky, Jess Johnson, Sarah Lemero, Sky Skinner, Joe Comics, Chris Hurst, Kefis Kaiser, Laura Demero, Kurt Mullen, Becky Sparks, Nathan Steele, Mick Sophus, Joe Hieresis, Joshua Swanson Blue, Celestial Dawn, Leah the Boyd, Troy Stull, Jason Knott, Zumila Kincaid, Jordy Lisero, Tony the DC Nerd, the Tipsy Changeling. Maeve, Luna T, Zophiel L, Grumpy Dragon 75, Nikki Gordon, Bloomfield, Crit Back, Strawberry Pup Trek, Kalis, Shield Maiden 4444, Fox E, Adam RDL Taylor, Kingy, Alexandra Lombach, It's a Bug, Not a Feature, Ulrich Bogdan, Barbara Borges, Abigail Marie, James Hodge, Corian Vale, Honkinen. Mwah. Love you all. You're amazing. Take care of yourselves, my friends. You dorks.